That Great Business Show, Ireland's best business podcast. ThatGreatBusinessShow.com is brought to you by De Facto Shaving Oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to episode 91 of That Great Business Show, posting on the 10th of June, 2022. I am Conal O'Moran, and today I am delighted to say I am joined as co-host by Ireland's best business broadcaster, my old pal, Vincent Wall. Vincent, you are very welcome. I said I'd never come out here and do this again, but it's it's kind of uh, addictive. So here I am again. Thanks for the opportunity. And a po- kind of poignant because on my way in here, I learned of the death of an old pal of mine and a man that you knew as well, Ray mm. Coyle of Tito fame. Yeah, I was very sad to hear that. I, I just saw it as well this morning. Uh, I, I, I don't know whether uh, Ray had been, had, had been ill or not. I see he was only 70 years of age, which is, you know, very young nowadays. Um, a fantastic entrepreneur. Uh, obviously owner and and founder of of Tato Park having sold the the Tato business um, and it's become Ireland's largest I suppose leisure facility now out there in Ashburn Um, but he was a very gregarious and colourful character He was great fun and I was with him when he was telling me about the plans to put his bison or his buffalo and his other bits and bobs out there and I just thought he was off his tree. And as usual, I was wrong. And he was right. And as you say, I think it is one of the top attractions in the country now. Well, I think so. And yeah. I mean, they've had their challenges getting the giant roller coasters in there because of the noise impact on, on local neighbours. But it's an amazing facility. It literally is kind of Ireland's Alton Towers with some exotic animals and birds as well. Well, poor old Ray, yes, they grew on him. So we will miss him because he was, as you said, very colourful. And what a reaction to episode 90. That's the one featuring Professor Martin Curley, the man who says that digitalization is going to transform the Irish health system from 80th, that's 8-0 in the world, to best in Europe in the next 36 months. I had calls, emails, texts, WhatsApps from around the world about it, and everyone wishing Martin and his HSE team well, and everyone I spoke to hoping it'll all happen uh, happens as planned. And if you've not listened to it, or if you know people or companies in the health business, make sure to send them a link to the interview. As always, it's on all of the best podcast platforms. And so to this week, we're going to have a chat in a second about what's selling well at the Kilkenny branded shops. And now that we're allowed out to play again, we'll find out what's the hottest employee events. And an Australian trade delegation is coming to Ireland very soon, and they want to hear about your business. All the great tips and insights that you'll hear are brought to you thanks to our sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil, the best anyone can get. De facto shaving oil, smooth as. Backing great women led businesses on every show. Now, in a retail world that has gone very blandity bland, where every main street seems to have the same handful of stores mostly imported from abroad, the Kilkenny name stands out proud on our streets. Kilkenny's 14 stores are home to Ireland's largest collection of Irish designers, and the company has been synonymous with promoting the finest in Irish designs for over 50 years. And I've just learned that they have two more shops under the Christie's brand, one in Killarney and one in Cove. The boss of all she surveys at Kilkenny is Evelyn Moynihan, who interestingly came through the ranks at Diageo, then moved to Musgraves before joining Kilkenny just three years ago, quickly making it to the top job there. Evelyn Moynihan, welcome to that great business show. Thanks for having me. We like throwing a curveball in at the very beginning. I was looking at your LinkedIn profile, and according to that, you are a fan of of Manchester United and England player Gary Neville. That pops up at the bottom of your LinkedIn. No? <laughs> no? So I don't know about Gary Neville. My husband is a big Man United fan, but... Unless um, he's been linking yours or something like that. <laughs> don't know about that, no. Anybody in a red jersey? Yeah, 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 absolutely. If you want to talk court to you, maybe I could get involved in that one a bit more. You were in your Kilkenny uh, shop on Nassau Street this morning and you said the tourists are back. 
Yeah, it's super to see it. Um, you know, it's great to see the lineup of buses all the way down NASA Street. And yeah, just journeying, journeying around the store just to hear all the international voices again. It's fabulous to see. Um, we've been looking at our date actually with regard to how strongly they're back. And in April, our tourism figures were back to about 79% of 2019 levels. So we're absolutely thrilled to see that. You know, we were gauging it to be back about 50%. So it's super to see that. That's just very strong. Yeah, very, very strong. And look, it's driven a lot by, I think, the um, airline numbers are really, really strong into the airports. And also the cruise liners are very, very strong into the likes of Cove and Dunleary. And that's brilliant for our brand because we have 18 different locations, as you mentioned, all over the country. 18? I had 14 down there, but the other two Christie's. So I'm wrong by two. Yeah. Yeah, so there's 18 in total. Um, so it's brilliant to see that, you know, um, or to have that kind of presence all over the country. Um, and it's brilliant to see the tourists back. Um, there's never been, I suppose, such a joyful welcome for them, you know, when you consider the last few years and how tough it's been for all our colleagues and staff, you know, on the shop floor and on in, in our restaurants as well. And uh, since I got my numbers wrong about your numbers of stores, tell me about the numbers of cruise ships coming at the Cove. So there's over, I think it's 77 uh, cruise wow. ships are due in between May and September. And look, it's fantastic for the location and for the area to see it. And look, when they disembark off the cruise liners in Cove, for example, we have two shops and a cafe just at the entrance. So it's fabulous to have them come in. And I suppose they really enjoy all the Irish designers and craft makers that we have on offer. Um, and it's brilliant to see that business come back again. We're delighted. What percentage in a normal year, and I know we're, we're just recovering generally in retail, Evelyn, but in a normal year, what percentage of your business overall would be to tourists? And, and what? And, and does, I presume it differs by store yeah, as well, does it? So look, this might surprise people, but it's actually 25%. People might have an impression that it's larger than, than that. But across a typical year, it's about 25% and then 75% coming through from the domestic market. Mm. But interestingly, when it gets to those summer months between May and September, it goes up to 50% you know, um, as high as that. So again, it's about having the right offer for the right customer, I suppose, as we kind of go through the calendar year. And would you change your stock in some ways to to reflect that changing uh, pattern of trade over the year? Yeah, that's really important, Vincent, actually, to flip, I suppose, the offer and to move with the customer throughout the year. So even if you take quarter four, like that's a big domestic focus mm. and Kilkenny Design is a brilliant place to come for Christmas It's gifts. a lovely shop at Christmas, yeah. Yeah, it really yeah. is. And people have a lot of family memories actually coming into the likes of NASA Street or some of our other locations. So we very much alter the offer and the range depending on the time of the year and depending on what customer is coming through our door. And I think that's very important for any retail business actually to really stay on top of that and to meet the customer needs, you know, as you're going through the year. And then interestingly, our online, I suppose, opens us up to a whole different offer. Um, and that's a brilliant way to display, you know, everything that we have on offer, be it, um, you know, be it for the tourists and our international sites or be it for our domestic customer as well. Like we're learning an awful lot through that process and actually really zoning in on what's selling, what's not selling, etc. Which is obviously very, very important because uh, the not selling is not so good. You told me that you have put a big emphasis on selling into the United States That's and that's new. Yeah, so recently we launched um, a new website into the US and a new website into the UK. And um, I suppose e-commerce has been huge for us and it's been a lifesaver. Um, I suppose that day on the 16th of March when the shutters came down on all our shops and restaurants, it was such a tough, I suppose, uh, day for, for society. But definitely I, I to focus on our colleagues, it was such a, a difficult time. You know, the pe we have people working for in retail and in hospitality for years and to have that happen was just really difficult. Um, but for us, it was a lifesaver to have a really good e-commerce site. We were investing in it anyway. We were bring, bringing in new skill sets to really kind of go after that opportunity. Opportunity. And we then literally had, you know, in the matter of about six months, three years of growth, it was that significant how, you know, engaging our domestic customer and our international customer was through our through our website. Um, but it allowed us as well to redeploy people from our shops who were out of work at the time and to get them into that kind of e-commerce mindset, which has been groundbreaking for our business, actually, um, you know, to get people's mindset into this kind of omni-channel way of doing business, if you like. 
And it's one thing setting up a, a, a website, an e-commerce website that you can sell stuff to to, to people in their homes in the, in the UK or, or the United States, sell them. But how do you actually market? How do they know that that website is there? Do you, do you, are you using social media to get to them or... Yeah, like it's a, it's actually an expensive business launching mm. into an international um, new ju- jurisdiction, if you like. And the States is huge, like Boston is near, as big as Ireland when you th- kind of think about it as a marketplace. So look, for us, it was really important to do a lot of research on editing the range, making sure we were clear on what, you know, people in the US, for example, were looking for from an Irish um, design and craft brand like ourselves. And then with regard to targeting them, it is about areas, actually, you know, for us, it is about, you know, the Bostons, the New Yorks, the Tex, the Texas, there's the places and the Chicago's, the places where there is a strong, you know, Irish diaspora. Absolutely. Is there Um, one in Texas? Oh, Texas is big for us, as in not, we don't have a location in Texas, but as a state, we do really well. We do really well. There's a really strong Irish community. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. I love listening to this podcast because I learn things all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, There's a lot of blank space to be filled there. <laughs> there is, yeah. A reverse engineer that for me now in terms of how you, say, take Boston. Yeah. How do you, it's the, more or less the same question that Vincent was asking there. How do you find those people? I mean, do you just blanket Boston or? Yeah, so to take a step back, I suppose, we um, gather information on our customers when they come and shop with us. Um, in our bricks and mortar stores. And we've been doing that for quite a while. And through that process, you're learning where they're from. Okay, so that's really important. And when you're gathering their data and and they're, you know, signing up to hearing from you from a marketing point of view, it's at that point, and that's the real opportunity point, start building the relationship with them. You know, we talk about, you know, having a life cycle of communication with the customer, getting to know them, you know, sharing what we can offer them from an Irish design and craft point of view and building that relationship as we go forward. And then I suppose going into a state like Boston, if you like, it is working with the various, you know, channels. You do have to pay for it, though. You know, you are kind of buying into, you know, new audiences, et cetera. But again, it's about getting, you know, what are the right you know, social media challenge channels that suit our brand and fit with our brand. And then definitely looking for those new audiences, if you like, and, you know, uh, putting offers out there and seeing how they respond and kind of building it from there. But it is, I suppose, a slow process and it is it can be an expensive process. So it is important that. I suppose, again, going back to targeting areas where there's a strong diaspora, um, where there, there's really uh, an interest in your brand and they want to hear from you. Does Boston buy the same stuff as Texas? So I, I don't know that data, to be honest, but um, in general, there's a very strong interest in the, the likes of Irish art, you know, the likes of Irish pottery and textiles, um, you know, the, the iron sweater is still really popular with it's the American a comeback, customer. Isn't it, the iron sweater? 100%. And it's actually quite cool, Vincent, yeah. again. Yeah. Um, you know. He's cool. <laughs> no, not the iron sweater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, look, I think there's quite there's quite a bit of commonality from our perspective on what people are interested from the US. But again, Irish people love sending gifts out to the US as well. And equally, people in the US love gifting from Irish brands if they have an Irish connection as well from the States, be it to family here or abroad. And do you uh, target the diaspora in the UK as well, or is it more general? So it's the diaspora really are are the ones really interested in Irish design and craft as well. Um, The UK is a a strong market for us. It's really growing, I suppose, again, in the new world of Brexit. And again, people not being able to travel the likes of an Irish design and um, craft brand like Kilkenny Design. You know, it has an awful lot of what people are looking for from a gifting point of view. Um, And people love the connection with, you know, whether it's Simone Walsh art and it's a picture of Cork and Shandon Street or, you know, a picture of, you know, um, a scene in Dublin, like all of that. I think there's a real, I suppose, growing emotional connection to Irish design and craft and that sentiment that people really miss or they yearn for. We have it in spades. So it's fabulous to see, you know, brands like Simone Walsh art or, you know, Enibus Jewellery where they really just capture that sentiment of what it is to be Irish and what it's like to be Irish. And they really buy into products like that. I'm from, I'm originally from a, a small place called Castle Dermot in South Kildare, and we're not that far from Kilkenny. So I remember the original shop opening and the parade in Kilkenny and what a beautiful place it still is. Um, and, and, and as far as I was aware, certainly in the past, there were some craftspeople actually working in the courtyard at the back. Speaking of the, the relationship you have with, with your artisan suppliers, if we may call it that, 
Do you work hand in hand with them? Do you tell them what tends to sell well from your perspective? Or do you let them kind of let their artistic creativity flow, generally juices flow, and then yeah. you take whatever they have? So it's a great question. I might go back in history for a minute because it, it'll help answer the question. Um, so Kilkenny Design is actually 60 years old next year. So we're heading for a big That's milestone. That's why I can remember it, Evelyn. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, look, the history here is the government um, set up a workshop to bring the makers and the designers together to help mentor them. And that was done in the grounds of Kilkenny Castle where our shop and restaurant exists today. And to, to today, there is still makers and designers in the courtyard out mm. the back of our shop actually making and designing, um, which is super. And why I kind of bring back the history is to roll forward to the future what makes Kilkenny Design different and unique is our buyers work with the makers and they sit with them on the product, the range selection. I suppose we're unique in that we're very close to the customer. We're hearing the feedback on the shop floor all the time. So our buyers sit with them on what are the latest trends? What are the customers looking for? How do we improve the packaging? Things like sustainability mm. are coming through huge as well from a trend point of view. So it's very much a collaboration with our buyers working closely with the makers to bring them to the next level. And they always give us feedback, the makers, to say we're helping benefit their business to go much bigger and beyond, if you like, the Kilkenny design even marketplace, you know, and it really helps them uh, bring their products uh, forward. And are you always on the lookout for, for new artists to, to relate with? Yeah, always, you know, um, always on the lookout for newness. I think newness is really important. Uh, we've always... I suppose, prided ourselves in being like an incubation, you know, where people can come in and you can see the excitement when they get their first listing with someone like mm -hmm. Kilkenny Design, you know, be it NASA Street or Kilkenny Design in Kilkenny City. And then we nurture them maybe to get to five of our shops and then we nurture them to get to all of our shops. So that is the, I suppose, success that we like for all. And um, so we're always on the lookout for newness. We go to Showcase, which is you know, a fantastic, I suppose, um, you know, um, celebration of all Irish design and craft run by the Design Craft Council. But it's it's at, you know, events like that where you do come across kind of newness and new, um, we met, Bloom is another one where we've met and come across um, new designers and makers. But we're very much open for business. So if there's any young Irish designers and craftspeople out there that have a product that believe that they can bring something unique and different to the shelves or to the, the digital pages of Kilkenny Design, we're very much open for business. What is selling well at the moment? So it's a great question. Um, See, so that's my, my question is great. <laughs> um, I would say wellness is a big, big trend. So Irish okay. Irish wellness and all our brands are actually Irish made. Um, every one of them. Every single one That's of them. That's fantastic. And we're very proud of that. And a lot of them started with us. So you've brands like, we just walked the floor earlier, looking at brands like Voya, Green Angel, Nanaya, you know, Human and Kind, um, new brands like Bio coming out of Clare. Um, the most gorgeous, purest Irish skincare product. Mm. Um, extremely sustainable extremely on trend and we're finding customers really coming to us for that and what's great is they have to come for repeat purchase as well you know because the skincare and like the the oil that you mentioned earlier it's called de facto say it de facto <laughs> very good because Tom Murphy will be listening de facto Tom so it's like your product where it will run out and you have to come back in I think they call it <laughs> you have to come back and refill and you know um, so wellness is a big one I would say Renovating homes is huge. Like we've all had it during COVID and lockdown and sitting and looking at the walls and looking to renovate and bring newness. So homeware now is like, it's like clothing. It's like, what are you going to change for this season in your house? You know, how am I going to transform the, transform the room for the spring, summer? Um, so art, pottery, um, all of that. Um, you know, we've got gorgeous wooden products like Caulfield boards, Ballyshane boards. Uh, products like that are absolutely flying it as well, which is great. And then I mentioned jewellery. Jewellery is actually our biggest category, which is interestingly enough for our brand. And again, we pride ourselves in, you know, having a, a really unique, I suppose, array of designers. Again, a lot of them Irish makers from all over the country. But again, people are really buying into sentiment. I mentioned that earlier and marking occasions but with a message, you know, and that's something that we have kind of in spades as well. And I think what Kilkenny Design has going for it that people are really into is products that last. 
in a very simple kind of statement. Apart that, from the wellness products, of course, which they have to come which back we and do buy. Want, we do want that return. <laughs> Absolutely. We do want that return. But, you know, you're buying into stuff that will last in your home, you know, throws, you know, um, I mentioned, you know, um, you know, chopping boards, pottery. This is stuff that's going to last. It's gifts that are going to last. And look, there is that kind of kickback away from fast fashion or disposable stuff, if you like. Um, so they have a functional as well as a kind of an aesthetic exactly, quality to them. Yeah, yeah. and I think yeah. that's important. And then mm. I also believe coming out of COVID, there's a real interest in Irish, backing Irish and backing local. And we're extremely passionate about that topic. And we can see that in spades as well. People coming out and backing Irish design and craft. And we're hearing that actually on the shop floor. And what's brilliant is we're hearing it from younger people. It's not just a generational piece. I think coming out of COVID, everybody relied on their 5K you know, coffee shop or their 5K local business that looked after them or dug them out for a gift, you know, coming up to Christmas. And I I just really hope that people don't lose sight of that, actually, and that we keep building on it. Well, it's a question I was going to put to you, uh, Evelyn. Are you concerned at all that, you know, if inflation begins to bite hard and for longer than a year or two, that, you know, people will go for the cheapest product on offer, regardless of where it's from, even if they, in their hearts... And minds would like to buy Irish, that their pockets are going to be just under pressure. Yeah, look, it's a fair challenge. And of course, I think there's no SME business out there not worried about inflation and the, you know, the rising costs for people and then the impact that will have. I think the onus is on all retailers to keep delivering value for money. But I think value for money is not just price and it's not just the race to the bottom. I think more and more people are realising. And again, I think it's coming to a younger generation the need for for quality, for things that last, for things that aren't disposable. Um, but I have to say, for for us in Kilkenny Design and all retailers, you have to keep a value for money lens mm-hmm. on it. Like the sales, the offers, the, the multi-buys, like this is the bread and butter of any retailer, but you're going to have to bring the value. But I feel the quality is equally as important when people are, are deciding where to choose to shop. And I think that's very important. Um And look, I think as well, kind of moving forward, um, you know, we're all looking at our costs. We're all looking at how we do things more efficiently, more effectively. Again, I think it's about collaboration with the makers. Like we want them all to survive. You Mm. know, it's an even bigger worry when you're looking at the smaller players and how they're going to survive. You know, their increased production costs and increased rates and all of that. So it has to be working together to see, you know, how can we cut the costs collectively, actually? How can we bring better value collectively to the customer. Part of shopping, the shopping experience is to go to a destination and enjoy physically bricks and mortar walking around. How and ever, I was talking to Bree Jo Donoghue uh, of, uh, I'd like to call her the Queen of Primark uh, on a couple of days ago, and she was making the very valid point about the big, huge black holes that there are in many of the main streets, shopping streets uh, in Dublin, in both uh, Grafton Street and Henry Street. That must affect shoppers and shopping and the shopping experience, including Kilkenny Design. Yeah, look, it's a real challenge. You know, none of us want to walk up Grafton Street or Patrick Street in Cork and see the shutters down, you know, just so takes from the whole aesthetics and the experience. Um, Like it's in every retailer's interest to have another strong brand go in next door. I think those days of, oh, look at the competition or do they sell what we sell? Like for us, that's absolutely gone. We want vibrant shopping centres. We want vibrant, you know, high streets. And like for us, it has to be government, local government, councils, trade bodies, retailers, hospitality providers all working together or it's not going to work. Um, We're a big believer in bricks and mortar. Um, and I think we can really see it coming out of COVID as well. People are flooding back. They want the experience. They want to touch the fabric. They want to see the piece of art. Um, they might go and buy it online later um, uh, or they might buy it and purchase it there and then or they might want to deliver it from that shop. You know, I think the choice of um, the end-to-end shopping needs to be there, you know, and how people shop. But the whole experience of bricks and mortar, I think, is really needed. And as retailers, we have to push ourselves to deliver bigger and better experiences, I think, as we go forward. So, for example, in our world, it's around Meet the Maker. It's about bringing to life, you know, the actual designer, the craftsperson behind the product. Now, that's an experience that you're not going to get everywhere. Mm. So I think the onus is on the retailers to step up. But I do believe the consumer need is there for that experience as well. And I think with those 
you know, tumbleweed moments in streets. Like we're going to have to work together to get the interest in, to get new brands in, you know, um, and to get people back into the town centres and the city centres. But we have to work together. This isn't going to be just one entity and their fault. You know, it has to be a collaboration. What would you do to bring people back into the city centre? Obviously, your shop is there, but if you had your magic wand, Mm. what would you do? So interestingly, we're involved with Champion Green, which is an initiative all about supporting local. And one of the one of the things we did in the last two years, which talks to this, is we worked with Aviva to give rent free spaces to new up and coming designers and makers for a six month window. And the whole thinking behind it was to bring vibrancy and newness to the street. So, for example, Jill and Jill, um, a fabulous mm. uh, designer maker, went in at the top of Stevens Green and Aviva came in behind that initiative and they gave the unit rent and rates free for six months. So it was bringing life to the street, but it was also proving to a new up and coming maker that they can do, make it in retail. And if they can take their numbers and build a business case, you know, to rent in the future, like that's success all around. And that was the thinking behind it. So I do more of that. We had another example of a fabulous brand called Amber Eyewear. So a really cool um, glasses uh, brand, Irish company uh, run by a couple. And again, if Eva put forward a unit um, out in Blackrock and they went into the Blackrock Frascati shopping centre. And for me, more of that, please. And again, I know um, it's probably a unique scenario where we were able to provide those two examples, but with the right people around the table, why can't we do more of that? What would you like to see less of in, I won't say in your shops, but in general? Do you cringe when you see little leprechauns and stuff like that? So I don't cringe when I see leprechauns because they're they're big sellers and part of our, our parts of our business. Um, I suppose for me, good customer experience, if I'm honest, you know, it's really hard to employ people currently. But what's near you? Is that to find them or retain them or? So we're lucky, if I'm honest, our retention is really high with our retail staff. But I've gone into other businesses where you know you're being met with newbies. And in fairness, we've all been there. We've all had our starting job. Um, But again, if they don't have the experience, they can't answer your questions. They haven't been trained properly. That for me is my biggest bugbear. And it's actually, I think, one of the biggest risks for hospitality and retail right now. Because, of course, you need bums on seats, you need people in the roles. But if they're not properly trained and they're not properly bringing the experience to life, it's definitely, um, I think, doing damage to the industry. So that's kind of a watch out uh, for me. Um, That would probably be my biggest one, to be honest. Personal question of sorts, uh, Evelyn. As Conal mentioned in in, in the lead in, you've worked for Diageo, you've worked for Super Value, Musgraves, um, and you joined Kilkenny Design three years ago. It's a family business. It's a family-owned business, the O'Gorman family. Um, I, and I know Connell interviewed Paul Kyo uh, recently and he's written a book about some of the challenges uh, of working for a family business when you're not of the family itself. I mean, was that a consideration when you joined the business and when you took on the top job? Yeah, so I suppose, I suppose it was. I, coming from Musgraves, um, which is a family-run business, but obviously run with a professional team, mm. you know, running it. Um, you get to work with independent retailers all over the country. So I had really good experience of that and seen how that works. And obviously with the partnership of Musgraves, which is a very well-oiled machine and a very successful model. Um, but it, it's successful because there's brilliant independent retailers all over the country doing what they do. Um, and a lot of it uh, operating with family business structures and all of that. So I had experience, I suppose, through my time in Musgraves. Interestingly, my first job ever, which didn't make my LinkedIn, was a job on the shop floor in Blarney Woolen Mills. Oh, okay. So selling water for Crystal um, and China to mainly US tourists at the time. So that was my first, I suppose, um, introduction to retail and to marketing in ways. And um, I really I really got the bug from there. So I kind of had a really good feeling for the, the company, the business, if you like, um, at that time. And I'm a local girl from near Blarney as well. Uh, you can hear the Cork accent, hear accent flowing, accent, no, no. I know, yeah, <laughs> flowing through the airwaves. So 
there was that kind of history as well. So then when the job came up in Kilkenny Design, um, look, what was key for me is that um, there was a good cultural fit, actually. Um, you know, that I got to meet all the personalities, both family and non-family, you know, at a senior level. So interestingly, my interview was with five or six people around the table. It wasn't with one individual. And I think that was great for me as well as it was for for the Kilkenny Design Senior Team because for me it was as much interviewing, you know, was this the right move for me as as much as it was was it the right move for Kilkenny Design to bring someone like me into the business. But pressing you a little bit, I mean, Marion O'Gorman, who you know who 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 ran the business for so many years and who is still the principal owner, if I'm right, you know, she's executive chairman, so or chairperson. Um, is it not a bit like? taking over from Alex Ferguson and Alex Ferguson is very much still there. Yeah, look, I, myself and Marion have a great relationship. Um, I came in as the marketing and business development director. So I came in on, you know, in that role at a really critical time. I was in two and a half months and COVID hit. Yeah. So look, it was either going to be make or break, you know, because it really was back against a wall when you operate in, you know, retail, tourism and hospitality as a sector. But for me, um, it just reinforced actually my fit with the company, the skills that I could bring. You know, they were already on an e-commerce journey. I had huge experience in the e-commerce and digital world coming in. My background is consumer insight and and marketing and, you know, going after that customer and meeting their need. Um, so very quickly, I think everyone realised the fit was good and the relationship was good. And then from from my perspective, I would describe Kilkenny Design as a family business, but very professionally run. And for me, I'm a very lucky lady because I have Marina Gorman, the legend, as a mentor, you know, and she very much is in that role. So I've got all the experience, the learning, the pitfalls all by my side, along with the freedom and the ability to drive forward and grow the business and bring it to the next level. So for me, it's kind of a winning combination, actually. Um, so There's a perfect segue. Where are you going to bring the business? We've very exciting plans for Kilkenny Design into the future. For me and for the business, it's all about um, delivering a winning omni-channel strategy. So literally that we're firing in all cylinders from an e-commerce point of view, both domestically, there's still huge growth as well as internationally. And that's about getting the right range the right at the right price, you know, with the right content. More bricks and mortar? Interested in bricks and mortar, definitely. Uh, but again, it has to be the right locations, um, you know, with the right footfall. You know, um, Ireland only or would you go abroad? For now, Ireland. But we're very interested in how we get on to international growth now from an e-commerce point of view, because you can see that a lot where brands go into markets from an e-commerce point of view and then they end up wanting to bring the experience to life in a different way. But for now, it's international growth through the e-commerce channel. Um, Sounds like they're going to open in Texas, Boston, <laughs> New York. <laughs> So um, have you gaps? Have you have you gaps on the streets in Northern Ireland, perhaps? Potentially, yeah, potentially. Like that's you know, the tourism market is is alive and well up there as well. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I suppose for us, we're calling twenty twenty two the year of recovery and growth. Mm, fair enough. And for you know the <laughs> locations that we have, it is still for any retail business still getting back on our feet, building the business back up, making sure you know all the the colleagues are trained up and skilled up. And then we go from there. We did go into Kildare Village as a pop-up last year and that was a huge success for us. And again, it's meeting new footfall, meeting new customers, bringing a new experience, you know, to the bricks and mortar as well. Much earlier, Vincent mentioned the experience of going into the Kilkenny shop on a Christmas. I'm just wondering, yeah, because it's just it's stuck with me since you asked the question, who determines, can I call it the feel of the shop, be it at Christmas, be it in summer or autumn or whatever? Do you have a little conclave of people who sit, th who sit down and say, this year we're going to go bigger on Santa Claus or well, wh how do you actually do that? So we have a, an amazing talent, a guy called Fergal, who's head of our visual merchandising. And um, again, we do quite a lot of safaris. We look outside of Ireland, London, into the States. Is that what they're called? Yeah, safaris. safaris. Yeah, you should go on one, lads. <laughs> go on a safari. Um, but it is the wild animals on the safari. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking a different type now, Vincent. But um, it is a great way to get out and see what's out there. Again, I think it's staying in tune with the customer and uh, what's the trend, what's the sentiment, you know, because it does vary. And it's really important, I think, that we're in tune with that customer and that sentiment at the time so as well. So next, this coming Christmas, yeah. have you gone on that safari yet? 
or do you know what this coming Christmas may look like in your shops? So we would have gathered all the learnings from last Christmas, you know, and what what worked, what didn't. And um, around about this time of the year, we sit and we reflect on the theming. Um, what's the, you know, lead campaign um, for the Christmas ahead? It's a huge event for us. It's a huge event for any retailer, but it's massive. And of course, it starts in late August, doesn't it? Well, a bit later than that. Um, but there's customers looking for that, so we're keeping in tune with uh, the customer need as well. Um, but yeah, it is then around the table, then exercise being led by that visual merchandiser lead around um, the team. How do we bring it to life? You know, um, yeah, how do we bring that customer to life? But interestingly, it's changing because it's not just about bricks and mortar. It's how do you bring it to life then in your digital world, in your you know, on your online sites. Um, interestingly, during COVID, we we launched a virtual site where you can go into NASA Street. It's on our site today and actually just tour around the shop, see the product in situ. And like for me, that's a lot of the future as well. You're asking about the future. It is about how do we bring experiences to life in a, a, unique, way, a unique way. So if you are in your sitting room in Texas and you are missing home and you'd love a bit of Irish design shopping, you know, to be able to do that, um, I think is special. And I think that's kind of part of the future as well. Have you ever gone down or thought of, or would it not be right for the brand, Evelyn, the, the, the QVC shopping experience on television? Yeah, we'd be very open to it. Uh, like we've great personalities in our business um, mm. and they've amazing product knowledge. So we'd be very open to it. I I feel it's, there's no channel that I, I don't think any retailer should be shutting down. And I feel that QVC. It might be is, a way of, of, of drawing attention to yeah, your online platform there now. There is yeah. a comeback on it. And mm. I, I've heard recently about brands going on TikTok and selling. So I think there is a whole new kind of way of doing it and way of selling that I feel we will have to mm. absolutely move with and try and get out ahead of. So I feel that whole QVC, um, those brands being extremely successful on it, you know, mm. so. Uh, uh, sculpted by Amy, by Amy Conley is one in particular. I, yeah. Every time I see here her winning yet another prize, yeah. incredible business, incredible yeah. businesswoman. Yeah. I have to ask you your last question. Who would Evelyn Moynihan hire in a heartbeat? So I have to show you this written down because you won't believe me. Um, so I shared a panel recently <laughs> with a fabulous lady called Amy Connolly um, and I actually had her as the person I'd hire in a heartbeat. And again, it's just her her leadership, her values, the clarity around her brand, her energy. And she's sound. She's just a sound girl. Um, so she was actually my person. She's also Team GPS because she has joined us on the programme. That's how I know so much about her. Super. She is incredible. Her backstory, fantastic. Evelyn Moynihan, thank you very much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Great to talk to you, Evelyn. Great to talk to you. Viscosity. When you shave, you want the highest viscosity because it helps the blade run smoother. De facto, the world's best shaving oil has incredible viscosity. That's why de facto leaves your face, underarms or legs nick-free. Higher viscosity makes blades last longer. De facto is the best for your skin and your pocket. DeFactoShave.com Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. That great business show. So, you're in the live events business. COVID hits and that's the end of that business. Or that's what could have happened to team building company Dynamic Events that has been providing corporate team building events to the Irish market for 25 years. Very, very quickly, they had to do one of our favourite pivots. And guess what? Their new quote-unquote online business grew legs and went international, picking up Deutsche Telekom and other big names worldwide along the way. And now that employers are doing anything possible to retain their employees, we thought we should find out what's available in the fun department to keep the workers happy. Niall O'Connor is a director at Dynamic Events and joins us now. Welcome to that great business show, Niall. Uh, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. It's a brilliant 
backstory about what happened with COVID. Yes. Discuss. Okay, so um, as we all know, uh, I think it was March 2020. Well, I suppose take you back to, you know, January 2020 when we might have heard about this um, flu or fever over in the far end of the world. And um, yeah, we didn't really, we knew about it, but we didn't know much about it. And then all of a sudden in probably February, we were hearing it. It was in Italy, I think, and parts of Europe. And then Within a matter of days, you know, I remember Leo Varadkar coming out onto the steps and telling everyone that um, we have to shut up shop. And on that particular day, actually, um, myself and my colleagues were heading into the round room in the mansion house to meet some clients who were bringing over an international delegation. And we sort of knew, like, why are we going in here? Because their event was, saying the April, um, because, you know, there's bad news coming. On the way home, uh, back to Blessing and where we're based, it's on the news, you know, we're going to be closing the schools and this, that and the other. So in the run up to that, the people were getting nervous about their events because a lot of our business is was international companies coming to Ireland. So they might have, as you know, Dublin's a hub for all the big tech companies. So they'd be having um, international sales conferences in Dublin and they would have delegations coming over from France and Germany and different places like that. So they had sort of, they were ahead of the game. So they were starting to cancel first and the phones were ringing. So, you know, we'd have a small element of cancellations on our on our diaries. But the second it really hit home was when the phone just nonstop ringing of people cancelling. Um, usually the phone would be ringing for people inquiring. So we had a decent calendar in ahead of us and um, all of a sudden that was kind of wiped. So we went to zero bookings. Uh, so what do you do then? Um, we were lucky enough. We had invested in t- different types of technology for a number of years and we were using technology in some of our events. Um, we're part of a network, global network, um, that we licensed the technology from. So straight away, that was our go-to. Different companies around the world who also licensed this technology just banged heads. We met three times a week on Zoom. How are we going to do business in a different type of way? So Went in, we did our last event in person, say on the 9th of March, for argument's sake, and then um, nothing then for, say, two or three weeks. But within three weeks, we were lucky enough that some of our customers trusted us to deliver what is an online team building event. They didn't exist. So um, we used the technology, we bring people onto a, a, a Zoom call or an MS Teams or whatever it's going to be, and um, have a bit of fun with them. So the main thing was to drive human connection between the different people because they're they're all working from home now. Uh, they're not, they don't get that usual office chit chat, the water cooler moments and everything like that. So a lot of people are isolated at the time. You know, they're working out of the spare bedroom. They have no interaction with their colleagues. We bring them online. We have an hour to two hours of fun with them um, in teams. So it wasn't like you're, well, there was a particular um, game that people used to play, but it was all very individually based, say quiz games where I'm on my own, I'll answer the questions and I get a score. But we were able to create this team environment to get people working together, having loads of fun together. And it just it just worked. And, you know, we obviously had a decent client base. We went out to them first uh, to see where they interested. Um, went out to a lot of our agents, you know, freebies and get them going. And then it started to catch on and um, we started talking about it online. Uh, we got a little bit of PR around it. And then... People would find us online from both Ireland and then abroad. So people were able to book us from different parts of the world. And that's how it grew. So just went from there. So in those in those first couple of weeks in March 2020, Niall, it wasn't just a question of what do we do now? And basically trying to, to, to just transform what you did in a physical space into a virtual space. You actually had to think as well about who yes. the audience was. Absolutely. They weren't in groups anymore. They were alone in their apartments and, 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 and yeah. flats. It, absolutely. So our traditional business model is we create activities and, and experiences for people that are together at business meetings. That's the bones of it. So now they're apart. So how do we get them together? We just use technology really effectively. We're able to sync up people's phones together so it feels like they're uh, together and we create an atmosphere in those Zoom calls to make it feel like they're actually at a real live event. And the feedback was was amazing. So, you know, that was what helped us through. And um, people were commenting on, yeah, I didn't feel like I was on a Zoom call because there was a huge kind of 
Zoom was a novelty for two or three weeks. <laughs> Everyone was doing it, you know, the family and you're just on it from work days and then you're Zooming your family and your brothers and sisters and cousins and parents and everything. And so then it became, oh no, not another Zoom call. But we, when people were doing our events online, it just didn't feel like they were, it felt like they were at a, a real event. And that's what we had to, because if we didn't make it feel like that, it wasn't going to work. So um, it caught on, thankfully. It did catch on because I'm looking at the numbers. 1,200 online events in 2021. Yes. So um, it was a bit of a slow start. So if you imagine we're starting in March, what we were doing is we're educating the market here, right? Because this type of product didn't exist. Now, there was a lot of other people that, that started to do it as well. How, do, how could you uh, teach people about it until, unless you ran events for them? You know, you had to show them living examples? Or yeah, did you? pretty much. Um, talk, demos, actually, that's what we did. We invited so many of our customers on for a free demo. And the, like a sales demo, sales pitches are difficult enough for people to attend on, not another sales pitch. But people actually enjoyed the sales pitch that we were giving them because we were giving them a taster of the game and they just had so much fun. And we still do demos, but we were at a stage where we were doing maybe four, five, six demos a day to decent clients. And um, those then started gradually turning into, into paid jobs, basically. But it took March, April, you know, through the summer, once we got to September is when we really started to notice the growth. So we went from maybe, you know, half a dozen, a dozen events each month. I think we did 19 events, 14 events in August. Then that doubled, say, to 30. Then that went to 72 in October. Then 144 in November. Then 250 events in December. We did 110 events, events in the week running up to Christmas because there was no Christmas party. So, you know, who do you call? It was, and the scalability was, was brilliant as well because if you imagine traditional event, you've got um, an event crew, event manager, you've got vans, they have to load the van, they have to go to the event, they have to deliver the event, the event could be two hours and then if they come home, they have to unpack the event and everything else. So that's one crew gone for the day. One crew online can run in maybe six, seven events in a day. Um, so, you know, the scalability is huge. So obviously the client is getting a, a cheaper price, you know, based on economies of scale and everything, but we're able to deliver the volume. I wonder about the price. What do you think, Vincent? Yeah, I'd say it's the same price, except that it's a turnover. It's just gone through the roof, maybe. <laughs> Question about the, the the events. What is the best or the the hottest or the most sought after event at the moment? And what, what does it look like? Okay, at the moment, we find that digital treasure hunts are definitely the number one most popular event at the moment. And the reason is, is because they're quite low entry level. They're a great way for getting people back together in person because obviously, you know, we've gone from 100% online back to maybe only 20, 30% online. So 70% is back to the in-person stuff. So what a digital treasure hunt is, it's um, it's it's a group of colleagues, you know, it could be 15, it could be 100, it could be 1,000 um, people that um, gather in, you know, a hotel conference room, it could be in their canteen and work. And we um, give them iPads and on that iPad is a map of their location. So it could be Dublin, it could be Galway, it could be Berlin. So we give them the, the technology, we explain how it works and what they have to do is navigate to different places in these cities. Uh, learn. They get to learn about their location and, and, and where they are. It's interesting. And then the complete challenges, they'll score points. We do a lot of photo and video challenges where they might have to recreate a movie scene, for example. The video is through the app itself. That gets submitted to the games master who's kind of controlling the event. They'll score that particular piece of content based on, say, creativity and humor. It's all subjective and it's a great bit of fun. But people are competitive. They do really fun things. But what we're doing is we're <laughs> capturing the event. So say the event finishes after an hour and a half, they might finish in a nice venue in town for a few pints or a bit of finger food. When they get back, all of their content can be displayed up on the screen. So um, when they get back, oh, there's, you know, Johnny from Team 7. Uh, look, he's having a great... Why didn't we think of that, you know? So it could have been a fun challenge that they did. And then we'll announce the winners. We have a live leaderboard. Uh, we give the... There could be prizes, medals or something a little bit better. But great entry level, easy to run. There's no massive amounts of equipment or there's no, you know, there's no massive organisation around venues and everything in. It can just be done very easily. And an interesting thing that came out of the pandemic was the fact that we're so used to uh, dealing with people online and using video conferencing we're actually able to deliver these treasure hunts um, remotely. So while the group of 50 or 100 people are together, enjoying themselves as if we were there with them, we don't have to be there with them. So again, clients can save money that way because they're not bringing us to them. Uh, we're um, saving the planet, I suppose, by not driving from here to Cork and back, saving man hours, saving so many different things. 
but the client can still have the exact same experience, which makes it also mean if we can run a treasure hunt in Cork from our office in Blessington, why can't we run a treasure hunt in Frankfurt or Vienna or New York? What kind of budget would you need for something, as you keep saying, as a basic or entry level for that? Um, entry level, you're looking at, um, you know, 20 to 30 euros entry level per person, pretty much. Now, there might be minimums right. on that. Yeah. So, I'd you buy know, a bit of that, yeah. You can have a lot of fun and... Um, the food and beer is separate. The food and beer is extra, <laughs> of course, but, um, you know, you have to tick boxes. <laughs> food and beer is very important, of course, as well, so... I just want. I've always had this thing about people living in Wicklow. Actually, you know that they're they're they're, they're different. Um, <laughs> Born I, mean, and bred. I mean that in the best sense. Um, what sort of mindset do you have to have, both as individuals and corporately within dynamic events, to come up with these kind of um, games, both yeah. phys- in a physical environment and in a virtual environment? It's an interesting question, but you always hear that kind of term, growth mindset. I suppose, or um, agile mindset, is reacting to things in a positive way. Very easily, we could have shut the door in March 2020, and we did have to lay off temporar- temporarily some of our staff. But obviously, there was government supports in place there um, to help people keep, which were really successful for a lot of event companies, especially to keep people on the books. And what our first goal back then was, you know let's get the business in, let's get paying customers again so we can bring back staff. So gradually we got, we actually ended up with more staff by the December than we had at the beginning. So. But like the, the mix of staff you have. The mix of staff we have. have. Like you have obviously people who drive vans, you have people yeah. in the physical world who bring stuff in, into venues and set them up and all that kind of thing. You've obviously got tech people, we, yeah. but have you got one or two people over in the corner devising games? Um, yes, we do indeed. Um, and it's probably the the positions that would be becoming more more available in a company like our own, where you're getting requests for more customized content, and that's where you need um, people who design games based. But no, we have um, creative people, we have logistical people with logistical minds, we have um, technical people as well. Which so we we have a broad range of personalities and skills. Um, but it's a lot to do with personality as well, because at the end of the day, we're a service kind of industry where um, p- people will buy from people. So when we're meeting people online for a demo, for example, you know, you need to have a bit of fun with them. You're, it's not the hard sell. You act, they actually need to, you know, mm. um, you need to engage with them and have a bit of fun with them. And if you don't get the sales, fair enough. And do you, do, will you keep growing the international business now? Because you've, it's, you've, you've broken the barrier in a big, big way. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as you work for more international businesses that may not have a presence in Ireland, um, they will generally have presence in other parts of Europe and America and different things. So that's how it generally grows itself. So you get in with one person, uh, you do a decent job, they'll tell a different department. And these companies are huge, like they've got hundreds and thousands of, of, of employees. Because your the lists uh, include that you're already dealing with Google, Deutsche Telekom that I mentioned, uh, TikTok, Amazon. Like they are vast companies. Huge. Yeah, and the size know, of countries. Yes, mm. they are indeed. Um, and what you'll find is, you know, th- these are the companies obviously that really do invest in, in the types of services that we provide. Um, so what will happen is, you know, someone from Amazon might call or email or whatever, and we'll we'll take a look at our, our one of our systems, our CRM systems, and um, we'll be able to see, like we've, we've done maybe 100 events for Amazon, but they will rarely know Oh, do you know Johnny there in the you know marketing department and they will have no idea who that's going to be because the companies are so big. But what might have happened is, you know, when a person in a company wants to organize a fun event, they will ask who else in the company has done a, an event like this. And obviously we aim to be top of the tongue there when they're talking about these things that they need to mention dynamic events. So um, then they'll we'll Google us or they'll know a contact in our place and say, oh, such and such a department did an event with you guys. Uh, can you send us a brochure or whatever it's going to be? So, And as you become more international and, and hopefully that will continue, do you find that certain types of events work better with different cultures, different countries uh, than, than others? Do you have to kind of tailor you, your... You do indeed. So what will happen is... Um, Take Christmas for an for an example. So if we were doing, say, an online Christmas event, we would have an Irish slash UK version of that event and an international version. So, and it, but it's mainly down to the content that's in that. Most of our events are obviously delivered in the in English, um, and English we find is a fairly common language among, you know, multicultural companies around Europe. Like they have they have German speakers and Polish speakers and 
but they'll all generally hopefully speak English. So um, the content will be different. Um, sometimes more cryptic games that you might command a very decent level of the English language might be more difficult for an international audience. So we just have to change it up a little bit. Presenters obviously need to uh, speak a little slower. You know, Irish people speak extremely fast. And even when we are speaking what we think is very slow, we might get a comment to say, we have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> That'll be the Which makes it all, yeah, the, it must be the, all the more fun. <laughs> yes, but it's interesting, like where we're based in Blessington, um, all of our our employees are from the local area, which is really good as well. Um, so, which is a great lifestyle for people, especially because it's a beautiful area, obviously, as well. But, you know, people driving in and out of Dublin, you're talking an hour to two hours commute in the morning and the evening. So it's great to be able to recruit talent in our local area. And uh, we just, yeah, it's just a nice place to work for people. A similar question to Vincent's ones there. Is there a difference in genders as to what they want to be entertained with and by? Um, can you rephrase that a little bit for me? Men versus women. Would, do they want different things? Um, it's hard to say, and we don't really like to go down that route. Um, what, what will happen is, you know, we, we, we offer something that will be, it's more, if, if a company comes to us, there'll be different genders, there'll be different ages. So you could have a company that will come to us with, you know, a bunch of, there might be graduates, there might be in their early 20s, and there's people elder, older, you know, 50, 60. Like us. Yeah, like, and I'm in the middle somewhere. So um, <laughs> what we try and offer is, you know, Something that will suit all abilities, genders, everything. Um, so there's nothing, we would not specifically say, oh, there's a bunch of um, men there. We have to do this because, we, you know, um, we just have something that will. Sports days, for example, we do a lot of, you know, back to school sports days. You remember back to your days in school? We'll reproduce that. That's a kid. nightmare. <laughs> I hated that. I absolutely hate it. Well, we, sports day. We, well, school, you, school is a much more pleasant place now, Colin, yes, than in the it 19th century. Be, it must be. <laughs> um, but saying that, like, you don't need to be a marathon runner or a fitness freak to be able to um, take part in one of our sports day because what we mix up is physical challenges with more cer cerebral challenges that you need to use your head a little bit more. So, um, yes, there's, they're suited to all. What a, I love technology. I absolutely love it. What have you seen in terms of technology that's going to hit your business in a good way? What, you know, are you going to have holograms of, will you be able to play football with Pele and people like that? Or you Yeah, know, no, it's an interesting question. And it's, it's something that we've, we've kind of used and dabbled in the likes of augmented reality. So that's where, you know, um, you might have your iPad or something and we'd have a game. So go back to your treasure hunt idea. You have an iPad or it's done on your phone. You might get to a location. And you might scan something, which would call, which, let's call it um, a trigger. So you scan that trigger and then what that does, it augments something on that. That could be a 3D model. It could be uh, a video of something. So what we've used it for is we didn't, and this was pre-pandemic when we, we did very little international business, but this is one example where we actually created a treasure hunt around a resort in Portugal that were doing a sales conference for a medical devices company, Hillram. So the, it's about 400 people they were trying to educate three different departments in the company. One department made hospital beds, the other department made surgical lighting, and the other department made heart monitors. So what we did was we created a fun game and one of the challenges was um, they, you know, navigate around the, the resort, they get to a GPS location, that unlocks a, a challenge. And the challenge will say, uh, tap on your phone and scan a 10 euro note. So people would take out a 10 euro note, they'd scan it and the hospital, the bed would appear as a 3D model. So then they could look around the bed upside down and beside it left and right. So now they understand, oh, that's what the other department make. They make those beds. That's, what, that's really what that crowd cool. do. Yeah. <laughs> and then same, you can look at the heart monitor. So that was, and that was kind of, that's kind of ahead of its time because I think we did that event maybe 2017. So, but now we're aware of that type of thing and we and once it's more developed, we can continue to push that type of thing. Virtual reality could be another big thing. But again, it's, we don't all have VR glasses in our pocket. We all have mobile phones, but we didn't have mobile phones in our pockets 15 years ago. So maybe in five years time, we will have some form of virtual reality glasses where we can provide an event that we can use virtual reality. There's a Meave based company that you should get in touch with called Hollow Toys. And they use incredible 
software on your phone and it's aimed at kids really but i'm sure it can be applied to uh, big kids like us and um it it makes dinosaurs jump out of books and stuff and i had them Excellent. in the studio it's fantastic yes like a good bottle of whiskey <laughs> yes what, 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 you, what you need to do is it, like it, it, a lot of these things will start off as like a gimmick or something but you need to turn that gimmick into something that's relevant and useful so once that happens be you mentioned there, Niall, that you you, you do events uh, as as small or local as, as as a school coming back event kind of thing. What's the biggest one you've done physically? Um, okay, so we do a really cool event every year. It started in 2015. It was called Techies for Temple Street. A uh, really important event for us as well because it was um, designed uh, uh, to obviously raise funds for Temple Street Hospital. So um, a group of people came to us back in 2015 um, they would have been the likes of Tom Kennedy and Ray Nolan, ex Um They obviously involved in the charity and they came to us to say, guys, we're looking to create an event. So we had a very short brief as such, um, but they obviously knew us, they trusted us, they knew we could come up with some form of ideas. And around at the same time, we had created a, a kind of a Twitter-based treasure hunt that was it worked quite well um, before we developed all the app technology and everything else. So what we did was we, we used that as a template and we started off with maybe, I think we had about four to 500 um, people attend all from the tech industry. So um, they would pay to enter a team. It was a networking slash competitive event, one day event in the summer from the RDS. They start in the RDS with a bit of a carnival atmosphere. They head out, they do this Twitter treasure hunt around town, taking loads, all those fun videos I was talking about, completing challenges. And then they come back for pints and burgers and everything. And then the winners are presented with a beautiful big annual trophy. So that started in 2015 and up to 2019, it had raised over a million euros and we had 1600 people took part in that particular event. Then it had to take a break. So now it's called Clash of the Companies. Jamie Heaslip's involved as well as a brand ambassador. And um, that's running on the, I think it's the, it's the 8th, 7th, 8th of July this year. So if there are any companies out there who would like to sign up Clash of the Companies, um, definitely go on there. Put your team in. It's great for networking, but it's also competitive. Some great prizes and everything else like that. But in saying that, that was 1,600. We actually just closed the deal yesterday. That's going to be over 2,000 people oh, for a festival event. So oh, that'll oh. be next. And... Go back to the world thing. Yes. You can take over the world. Uh, well, we can certainly try. From it's, 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 it's a very yeah, big, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a big place, the world. So <laughs> if we can take over part of it, uh, we'll certainly try. But it's, What do you need? Uh, you said that you can hire locally, and uh, but like, there are limits to the numbers of people who would be in your industry in Blessington? Absolutely, there is. And that's why we can rely on uh, a global network of people as well. So, for instance, we did an event recently for, for Google where they had, uh, it was a type of a hybrid event because obviously hybrid's a big thing now as well. So what we had was we had people in the Dublin office, in the Zurich office, in the Berlin office, in the London office, and people online on Google Hangouts or Google Meets. So we had a particularly busy day that day, but we have a network of freelance uh, online presenters that we can depend on. So I had uh, two people from South Africa running an event for people in Dublin, Zurich, Berlin and London and online. We would have obviously project managed the event and designed the structure of how it would operationally run and everything. Um, but it's great to be able to call on people like that. It, we could have easily had a co-presenter in Chicago, for example, on the same event. Um, so that's how you scale. That's how you're able to uh, respond to that type of demand. Plus, if you go back to the, think of the volume of what I, what I was saying, we did 110 events in a week with a team of you know, it was probably 10 people at the time. We've also been, you know, really, technology has been really important in being able to manage that type of volume of work. Because if you imagine the amount of moving parts in an event, um, you've got start times, end times, uh, number of people, number of teams, you need staff, you need support staff. You've got Zoom links and MS Teams links and loads of things going on. So, we actually work with um, Salesforce, who I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, we've been working with them since 2016, where we built out a custom-made, um, it's pretty much a project management platform that takes everything from our lead through to our sales process into our operations process, customer service, spits out the invoice at the end. And then there's a kind of this circular thing that happens where the customer obviously comes back and books another event. But that's been really important. And it's um, we were unintentionally prepared prepared for this kind of crisis that happened, we wouldn't have been able to manage 
that volume of events without a system like that. And it's it's really important to continue to invest in technologies like There's that. There's another question which is begging to be asked, which is, what about technology as in the internet? As in, you must must creak sometimes if you are trying to run all of these things out yes. of Blessington. Well, I'll tell you an interesting thing, actually. In 2019, <laughs> we were using about 2,000 litres of diesel a week, a month. Um, and that converted into Zoom licences in to 2020, 2021. So we weren't spending money on diesel anymore. We were actually spending a hell of a lot of money on licenses for Zoom accounts and WebEx and all like that. But as well as that, we did have to bring in like backup internet connections. Obviously, what we have is we have, um, we converted our warehouse into a couple of studios like this so we could present to different people. So you could have three or four studios with three presenters with green screens presenting to different people around the world. But if the internet went down, we have a backup option that's a separate provider. There's a piece of technology that you know, within five seconds, a bit like your mobile phone, when you're on Wi-Fi and the wi- you go out of Wi-Fi, you don't go off the internet, it goes onto your data. So it's like that. So if the internet went down, the other internet kicks in so we don't lose any service. Then you also have backup hosts that might be working remotely on a separate internet connection altogether. So if something goes down, you know, if there's a phone call or a message pinged out, someone takes over. As well as that, you've got electricity, which it's pretty reliable in this country, but not always reliable. So if you're running eight, ten events at the same time and your electricity goes, your internet's gone. And what we have is we have generators. So a big switch upstairs and downstairs. Big operation. Yeah, but that's kind of what you have to, because what in Just events... Just into the price, of course. Well, it's, it's, of course. Um, people don't see this, I suppose, when they're looking for discounts. I'm but, beginning to cry now. <laughs> but that's what events is all about. It's about, because if you imagine an event, it's a, it could be a one hour piece, live piece, but there's hundreds of hours went into producing that piece and it's all these backup things. That and it has place. to happen at that particular time. It has time. to happen. You mm. can't say, okay, come mm. back in an hour or come back tomorrow. It has to happen in that time. Mm. So, yeah, it's important to plan these things. The second final question, because there's always a third and a fourth final question, is the, um, you're hiring, am I right? Uh, yes, we are indeed. Well, you better give a shout out because well, people are listening. We're looking for a very enthusiastic um and it can be from any discipline, not necessarily event management, um, for the business sales executive or uh, business development uh, coming out of college that really wants to get their teeth into this type of work and get to meet a lot of, uh, you know, big players in the market around the world. Um, because, yeah, it's just to handle the, the volume of, of inquiries that were, that were taken. So. But they don't have to live in Blessington? Not necessarily, no. Yeah. I know we do have a lot of Blessington people living around, but... Uh, or in the company, but no, absolutely not. They can be from anywhere. So the final, final question is, who would you hire in a heartbeat? Um, it's a good question, isn't it? And I suppose you do have to think about that. Now, I, I'm i not sure if they would come and work for us, but I do admire, I, th- I might get some blowback on this, but Jurgen Klopp, um, to, to all those Liverpool fans, I'm sure everyone's familiar with Jurgen Klopp, but what I really admire about him is, is, is the humanity of the man. Like he's the type of man that you could see yourself going for a few points with. Um, I can imagine him walking into, you know, Liverpool Football Club and him like he's not walking in with a suit and straight up to his office. He's probably chatting his way all the way up and having the crack and he just doesn't really care. And he, he can just bring the best out in people from what I can see and creates that really fun environment to work in. And that's what we want to do as well. So That all makes sense. Absolutely. Makes yeah. sense to me, yeah. Yeah. Well listen, Niall Niall O'Connor of Dynamic Events. Thank you so much for joining us on that great business show. Very enjoyable. Great to meet you now. Onwards and upwards. Thank you. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Thinking of travel? If so, make sure to make de facto the world's best shaving oil your choice of travel companion. A 25 milliliter bottle of de facto means no hassle at airports, no bulky cans to carry, and the guarantee of the world's best shave. DeFactoShave.com. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. We had Colette Toomey, the Clonakilty Black Pearl.
Pudding Boss with us on episode 87. She told us how her company cracked the Australian market, coming up with a very clever workaround on how to retain the freshness of her products while selling it on the other side of the world. And I'm sorry, but you'll have to listen back to hear how she did it, but it's a good one. Clannacilty is a lovely example of cracking far away markets. If, like so many other businesses, you're interested in the 25 million person market in Australia, you'll be interested in a trade delegation from the Irish Australian Chamber of Commerce heading this way. And if you are interested in Australia, well, they are interested in meeting with you. Barry Corr has been CEO of the Irish Australian Chamber for the past 12 years. And due to the time differences between us, I can see via Zoom that Barry is already in his pyjamas in Melbourne. Barry Corr, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thank you, Connell. Um, I, uh, I, I've been caught out in the old track seat, so uh, um, there we go, the wonders of technology. You are heading to Ireland, and obviously with that uh, strong Australian accent you have, you obviously are just uh, coming home, are you? I originally come from a, a place in Tyrone called Cal Island. Um, and I'm, I'm told I'm very fortunate to be married to a girl from West Belfast. So uh, she makes me she makes me talk like I come from uh, somewhere way up north. And you are, as I say, coming with a delegation. How large is the delegation uh, that is traveling? Uh, so we, uh, we we have over 20 booked into the Mesville who have looked after us very well. Um, I I started at ten, went to fifteen, went to twenty. I might have squeezed another couple in for a couple of nights, but Tara at the Mespel has been very helpful, and uh, we're very grateful to her. Well done, the Mespel Hotel. So, who and what are you bringing over, and who and what are you looking for over on this side? Uh, the the group that we're bringing uh, fall into to two camps. Uh, we've got a group of Australian businesses who are coming with us, who are from all sectors, from uh, you know those up in the Pilbara and the mines, uh, through to digital health companies, through to uh, an arts uh, business as well. And alongside that, Ireland is the chair of a group called Australian Business in Europe this year. It's like the sort of the, the revolving presidency of the EU. Um, this is the first time that Ireland has chaired the group. Um, so one of my jobs as chair is to convene the annual meeting of that group. So we'll also have delegates coming in who run the Australian chambers in different parts of Europe. So France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Switzerland, Netherlands, all coming in as well. So it's a big piece of work. And you are, as you say there, you've got a very wide range of businesses coming over. A bit similar to our listenership, who would you like to meet up with on this side? Uh, look, this delegation is like no other that we have brought before. Uh, previous delegations have been primarily based around buying and selling. So people want to come to Ireland to find suppliers or they're coming to Ireland to find customers. What we're seeing this time around is a much more diverse and sophisticated uh, delegate. Uh, some are coming to look to see if they can woo some talent to work in Australia uh, for their businesses, uh, particularly those in trades, in engineering, um, architecture, uh, infrastructure project managers are going to be highly sought after. Um, so talent is very firmly on the agenda. What we're seeing also is an interest in understanding are there potential joint venture partnerships. So it's not so much, hey, we're in town, do you want to buy my stuff? It's this is what we do. We understand what you do. Could together we make a lot more money for each other. Um, so there's a lot more focus on partnership. I did laugh when I saw uh, the, um, the circular that you sent around and that you are looking for talent because one of the problems we have here is we have no talent. Do you know where, the, where they've gone? All our young doctors uh, are in Perth, Australia. And I think lots and lots of our tradespeople have gone down there as well already. So uh, th that'll be a bit thin on the ground. 
Tell me about anything in particular, any particular sectors in Australia at the moment that are, I suppose I'll use the word hot, that anybody listening might say, you know, there is an opportunity, particularly in this sector, to do a bit of business on the other side of the world. Oh, Nick, the, the biggest area of investment in Australia at the minute, without any shadow of a doubt, is based around uh, infrastructure. The pandemic recovery strategy by the various states and territories, as well as federal government, has been primarily around big government projects. Um, And this is something that I I saw something on TV over here a few weeks ago where they talked about the Sydney Harbour Bridge was uh, effectively a project that was underwritten by government to keep Sydney out of the recession uh, of the, uh, the the Great Recession uh, nearly 100 years ago. Um, so what we're seeing now is big investment by government in bridges, rail tunnels, um, you know, major, major investment. I mean, some of these projects are 50 billion Aussie dollars. Um, they'll take 10, 15, 20 years to complete. So that's created a massive, massive demand in the market. And I see that you're traveling on the 20th now. So when will you be available to meet with people? Hey, so I will I will lead the advance party. I'll be uh, coming in over, over the weekend, uh, making sure the hotel's still where it was the last time I was in Dublin, which is, uh, Craigie, probably about four years ago now. Um, and uh, we'll have some of our delegates arriving over the course of Monday and Tuesday. Uh, So Monday will be a fairly easy day. Things will ramp up over the course of Tuesday with uh, some very sector-specific briefings. Wednesday is our big digital health day. Uh, So anyone who has an interest in digital health uh, in Ireland, we'd be very keen to hear from them. Um, Anyone uh, wants to to get involved in that can drop me an email to ceo at irishchamber.com.au. We, we've been really pleased with that group coming out this time uh, because we see it as an area of op- opportunity, uh, an opportunity for collaboration between Ireland and Australia as well. Thursday will be a big focus on talent. Uh, we've got a very enjoyable social occasion on the Thursday evening, which is open for bookings on the website uh, as well. Uh, which is our annual summer barbecue at the Australian Ambassador's Residence out in Killiney, uh, which is a fantastic setting for a great event. Uh, we usually have a couple of hundred businesses there, um, and it's a, it's just a smashing evening. Friday morning, we're heading north. We'll have a stop off in Newry to uh, have a site visit at a business who are living the jam on both sides of the sandwich in terms of the protocol. So hopefully it still intact by the time we get there. I know that's a couple of weeks away and who knows in the north at the minute. Um, Then uh, we'll hopefully have a a meeting with the incoming First Minister, uh, a trip to Catalyst Innovation Centre in Belfast and finish with a dinner in the the Grand Central Hotel. Uh, So uh, a busy week, but we'll... uh, we'll have a bit of time for interaction as well. And I know that I sent you over a link to uh, Professor Martin Curley when you mentioned digital uh, health. And the, there are some incredible companies uh, that are doing incredible things here that I wasn't even aware of until I chatted to Martin on episode 90. So if they want to get involved with you, and if any other company wants to get involved with you, The simplest way is to do, sorry, I should actually first of all start by saying we are talking about Monday the 20th of June through to the end of that week. Isn't that correct? That's correct. So our our delegation will arrive on Monday, Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday the 22nd is our Digital Health Day. Uh, Thursday the 23rd is our Careers Open Day, which looks like we're going to have to go to bigger lodgings for it because of demand. So that's good. Um, and Friday we'll be heading north, so anyone uh, who's listening in the north can uh, um, get a hold of us to uh, interact there as well. And it's on the website, which is? Uh, which is australianchamber.ie. And that, that is, and they can book and chat to you there. And can anybody go, because this is, uh, has attracted my attention, can anybody go to the ambassador's residence? Uh, tickets are on sale for it. It is First in 
best dressed, as the Aussies would say. Um, it's a very, very popular event. So if uh, if anyone wants to go who hasn't already uh, booked their tickets, I would suggest get on there and do so very quickly indeed. And you did say a couple of hundred businesses there, yeah? Yeah, look, we, uh, we're, we're expecting uh, a couple of hundred there. Uh, we, we'll be bringing in you know, quite a party ourselves. Um, so alongside our, our brilliant members in Ireland um, who represent some of the best businesses with an affinity to Australia, uh, it's it's a fantastic day and it's, it'll be everyone together again after what's been uh, quite quite a bit too long. Well, uh, we all agree with that. Barry, I hope you have a great trip here. We might catch up to find out how you got on. We're going to circulate this, obviously, to Team GPS. Those are our lovely listeners. And uh, hopefully we will drive some business your way. Barry Corr, CEO of the Irish Australian Chamber. Thank you so much for joining That Great Business Show. Thank you, Colin. And that's it from That Great Business Show, Episode 91. A very special thank you, Vincent Wall, for uh, joining us. Great to be here again. Really enjoyed it, as always. And uh, I have to say, uh, it's a great opportunity for all businesses uh, to sell themselves uh, on that great business show. I'm a business myself. I might go along to that uh, event in the Australian Embassy that Barry Corr mentioned, you know, just I sell my wares. (laughs) Good eye. Good eye, folks. You won't be doing impressions anyway. Do please share this podcast on social media and do it now, please, before you forget. A click of the button for you, commercial success for us. And don't forget to press the subscribe button right now as well. And you can always talk to us directly on our LinkedIn page. Great brands like Big Red Cloud, Microfinance Ireland, Ismi, Virgin Media, Udras Nagurta, all advertise with us and your business should do likewise. And speaking of Big Red Cloud, the CEO Mark O'Dwyer was on to me to say that they have teamed up with the Kildare Wicklow Education and Training Board to deliver a suite of new payroll and bookkeeping courses designed by industry experts specifically for the Irish market. And the blended courses combine flexible learning and practical skills based tasks enabling. Listen to this one. A learner with little or no prior knowledge to gain employment or upskill themselves to work in a payroll or accounts department. That's not bad. Mm. That's all, it's all, all free and for nothing is what he told me, I think. All of our great business insights and tips, as I often mention, are brought to you, as always, thanks to our sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil, the world's best all-natural shaving oil. And anybody should check out Niall O'Connor's beard. Our guest today <laughs> had the best beard, I think. He's like a young Ronnie Drew. Uh, and uh, very carefully quaffed as well. Mm. We work with our great friends here at the Dublin South Podcast Studios, including the Wizard of Oz sound engineer, Mark McCarthy, who makes us sound so much better. And later, studio manager Peter Rice adds those zips and zings that make our podcast the world's best sounding. And the Dublin South podcast studios are open for business and if you want to record a podcast check their website and have a chat with peter rice and if you'd like the media group that's us to produce your podcast well then just give me a shout you'll find me as usual on linkedin and don't forget to buy business plus magazine where we now have our regular column all about the podcast so that is it from me conal moran for me 